At this time, we'll reconvene the uh, budget workshop. And the first thing I want to note is our clerk, uh, Katie, is not going to be here tonight. Her mother is being transferred over to Biden and Greenville. So we ask that you keep her in your prayer. And we also have uh, some comments by Randy. So. Yeah, I'd like to take about 30 seconds to thank the Barford County Sheriff's Department for their increased uh, presence at schools. It has been really helpful in this time of what's happened in uh, Texas. Um, I've been seeing on TV, they show a Barford County Sheriff's car and they thank the uh, Washington City Police. The city police is probably involved with it too, so I'll thank them as well. But it's really been appreciated, and, and Carolyn's gotten some really good positive uh, comments, and uh, so thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Brian, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, as you recall, this is our service expansion uh, session of the budget. We've gone through the continuation budget, which is what it will take to continue to do the existing services that you have this year in the new year with the addition of the two programs that you previously voted and approved, which was the Beaufort Promise uh, and the Workers' Compensation Internal Fund. So tonight you'll hear from, first you'll hear from internal departments that will talk about um, items that are new or different to the budget um, that are not part of continuation, that are not something that is um, required every year. They are, it may be something they'd like to change about a program. Um, and it's also things that are general in nature. Uh, we always do COLAs every year as a search expansion. We don't put those automatically in the budget. That's a policy determination by the board. Um, so we'll start out and we'll run through these. We have outside agencies as well. And typically in an outside agency, you may either see an outside agency who is currently funded, who's asking for additional funding in the upcoming year, or you may see a new outside agency that's not previously been funded and is asking for new funding. Um, and the way we work that is, if that outside agency is approved for that funding, then it goes, unless the board says it's one-time funding, then we assume it to be continuation funding and we would put that same amount in for that agency next year as well. So once, essentially, once you get in the budget, you stay in the budget until it gets pulled out by the board. Okay. So, um, so we will start off, we'll run, it starts on page 211, that is the general fund, and we have the general fund, the water fund, and the sewer, fund, uh, sewer sorry, solid waste fund, um, and a couple of these apply to that, but then you'll also have um, a couple of expansions within the solid waste fund that we'll hit directly. Um, as I spoke to you before, I generally handle the ones that are related overall to the departments that are not specific to individual departments. So I'll bring your attention to the proposed COLAs. Um, that starts on page 213. You have uh, a note that was passed to you um, that shows five, six, seven, eight. Um, there was a question regarding what was the reimbursement from DSS and the health department because there is a portion of salaries that are reimbursed, salary and benefits that's reimbursed by the state, both from the programs at DSS and the programs at the health department. So uh, the finance officer calculated those for you. So what you see on page 213 is a larger amount. We've given you the new numbers, and I'll hit those real briefly. But we've included in your service expansion package, starting on page 214, um, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's what we look at every year uh, for the consumer price index for the South region. Um, again, that is consistently what we have used throughout the years to look at what the CPI is for the last 12 months. You'll see that on the front page on 213, if you looked at, all, at March, the last 12 months for March, um, they showed that as 9.1%. And then in April, of course, we were, we, we, uh, this came out after um, the April 12 month is 8.8%. So um, you know, typically the way we show that is we look at CPI and we give you one or two numbers that are generally somewhere around what the CPI is. 
We, uh, we show you in this um, proposal either 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%, or 9%. Um, so in the, in, the, in the new sheet that you have with you, so I'll just hit the 5% COLA. Um, you'll see that's general fund salaries of a little over $18 million. The 5% COLA is 913000 The benefits associated with that that we have to pay out are uh, 199000 and change. Um, so the total, um, I'm sorry? Yeah. So the total there is $1,112,535, one and then you take off the reimbursement for DSS and health at two seventeen two twenty two. dollars So the total cost, the net cost, once we get the reimbursement back, what the impact to the general fund for a 5% COLA would be eight ninety five three fourteen. dollars So we show those for you in those increments, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Be glad to answer any questions you have for that. Uh, <coughs> And just to also tell you that when we when you do those, typically when you consider those, you're considering them for the water fund and the solid waste fund. So on page 339, you'll see the water fund, um, and those are simply that that's the colas as well. And there's a small amount in the solid waste fund for those because we do pull some funds out of that in paying for solid waste work. So any questions regarding cola proposal? Any any commissioner John? <clears throat> Brian, do you have any idea what surrounding counties or cities are doing? Uh, in general, what we heard, uh, I mean, we got the proposed, we got a, a, a listing from the North Carolina League of Municipalities that showed that generally across the state, it was it was an, on average about five percent. Uh, my understanding in looking um, at our neighbors to the west. Um, the folks that we're surrounded by have merit as well, so there's generally four and plus merit, um, so generally around five. I mean, I, I think that what I have heard and seen on the listserv, the manager's listserv, is that's generally what folks are looking at. But, I mean, that all depends upon, you know, I, I would say that to you is, um, I would look at what we have here, what the impact is for us. Um, I mean, I understand looking at at what our neighbors may be doing, but there may be other things going on with our neighbors that, that may be different to us. So. Other questions? Okay, you want to go to the uh, 401 yes, case? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, flip on back, and that starts on page 219. Um, you recall, I, I, I talked to you about this the other night. So the North Carolina General Statute requires that every local government, whether it be county or municipality, provide 5% to coal, uh, 5 percent to 401k for law enforcement officers. That's in statute. You have no, um, uh, you're required to do that every year. You provide 5 percent. There's no required match by law enforcement. Um, so what we are proposing currently, you'll see on page 219, the county provides some match to employees, and it is a match. It's not just a giveaway. Um, if a if you will match up to two percent of an employee putting money into their 401k. So what you'll see is if, if a county employee puts in 1%, the county will match that at 1%. If a county employee puts in 2%, the county will match that at 2%. But 2% is as high as the county goes, um, except for law enforcement officers, and you are required to, mat to put in 5% for them, whether they put in any at all. So in our conversations, um, and I've actually worked in a, previously I worked in a municipality where the, where the, um, where the council said, if we're going to do that, if we're required to do that for our law enforcement officers, we're going to do that for all our employees. And we had some discussions about that. I, that's not what I'm proposing in this in this proposal. What I'm say, asking you to do is look at it and decide whether you may want to increase the two percent up to five percent, so that you'll see if a if an employee were to contribute three, then you would contribute three. If they were to contribute four, you would contribute four. But you would max out at five. So if they contributed five, you would contribute five. Um, so that's the proposal. You'll see that there's also a, a sheet that was given to you that does the same thing, breaks out the numbers for that. There was one little um, uh, mistake on it. You'll see where um, it actually shows 2% and 3%. I think Anita told everybody about that. But So if you were to add 
uh, to current, it would cost you 147779 out of the general fund. You would get a reimbursement of 36215 So the total cost of that impact to the general fund would be 111564 So you have that. So if you were to say, okay, we, we, we'll we bump it up a, a 1%, then the impact to the general fund would be 111564 But you wouldn't pay that. And, and that assumes that everybody puts that in. So you would match everybody. Not everybody does that. So... Um, be glad to answer any questions you may have. Can you can you provide us uh, in an email what percent of our employees now are contributing, contributing on the 401? Yeah, I can tell you there's just that maybe two handfuls, maybe eight or ten employees that just do the 1%. The vast okay. majority do 2% to get the full match. Correct. So it's, are you saying... Almost 100% on the 2%? I would say a good 95% okay. on the 2%. Okay, well, then, that, mm -hmm. then we're, I'm good with that. Other questions? All right. Okay, the second one under general fund for all employees is the employee dental insurance. You remember in, two, in 2017, the board engaged the MAPS group to do a pay study. Not only did you engage them to look at the market analysis of where we should be with our peers, you also asked them to look at the benefits to see how we stacked up against what they considered to be our peers. So the MAPS group chose nine other county and municipal governments that they, in their determination, thought were our peers, they were generally the same. Um, and out of that analysis, Beaufort County was the only local government in the group that did not pay for some portion or all of an employee's dental insurance. So this is a proposal for the board to consider of paying um, the the dental, the employee only dental portion for for staff. Um, that is at 38.60 per employee per month, and you'll see on page 220 what that breaks down to. Uh, 165.81 for the general fund, 12,116 for water, and 200 dollars for solid waste. Um, be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding that. John? Brian, is this one of these in, in dental insurance plans that capped out at $1,000 and it only per, pays for certain things? And it, 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 I mean, it does. Uh, it is a, and we can certainly get you a copy of what it is. I mean, there's, it, it's, a, it's a fairly robust dental plan. I mean, um, we, we, uh, they changed it a couple years ago to where they would allow you to roll over some of your benefits to a second year so you didn't lose the, the maximum. Um, employees can buy up in it, so if you want um, other additional um, orthodontia, those kind of things, you can buy up. But, uh, but it's, a fairly, it's a fairly standard plan, I think, and is, is, is um, for what you see across uh, local governments. Other, <coughs> other questions? All right. You want to go to the communications director? Yes, sir. This is my last one for you because this is out of the county manager's office. Um, several meetings ago, several regular board meetings ago, we had this discussion with the board about uh, communication director's position. Um, so starting on page 221, you have the proposal, and then behind that on 222 and 223, you have the job description for that position. Um, I brought that to you several months ago to say, to, to ask were you going to move forward with that because I didn't want to spend the, the money with the MAPS group looking at it to determine if that was something, uh, you know, if you weren't going to move forward with it, then we didn't want to spend the money to look at it and have it studied. Um, so looking at that, the um, due to the technical requirements of it um, and what they would be doing, it was graded out at grade 73, so you'll see what those what that lays out. The midpoint, which is where we always look at, we always when we're funding a position, we always fund at midpoint, um, simply because we could be anywhere in that range, and what we don't want to do is be below us. So what I'm saying is, if you were to hire somebody, you may not be at that maximum amount, but we've we've pegged it at midpoint of grade 73, which is a little over $72,000. You figure 22% for benefits and insurance, so it's about a $95,240 position if you wanted to do that. Um, you, you can read the job description. Um, what I heard the board say really clearly was that there was some interest in having some additional things done relating to public information, uh, working on meeting film, uh, filming meetings, and doing other things in the public 
uh, education and communications realm that we are not able to do. Um, as you know, we currently have existing staff uh, filming these meetings, editing, uh, pull them together. I actually put them out on the on the uh, on the server so that they go to suddenly. We now control that. Um, but in order to rise to the level that I thought I heard this board indicate they wanted to be, I think you've got to put somebody in place to do that uh, as a full-time job. There's certainly plenty of work we could have them doing uh, across our entire departments uh, to help educate the public on what we do and, and what things are available. So um, that is there for your consideration. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Any, any questions? I think we probably discussed that in previous meetings, but any questions? So, my, my question to the manager is, I, I heard you to say, and I may, I may be wrong, that you were looking for final guidance now before you put this into the final budget, or is it already in the final budget? It is not in the final budget, it is in the service expansion, it's for the board to consider if you want to do it or not. I simply asked the board a couple meetings ago. So we'll have to take a vote. You, you, uh, yes, you have to take a vote on every one of these. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, everybody good? All right, you want to get to the next item? Yes, sir. This is an item from DSS, and it's about uh, for them to remodel the conference room. Uh, and DSS his staff is here, so I'm going to let them handle that, as we always do. I, I don't present for the departments because it's their service expansions, and, uh, and I try not to get involved with those so that there's not any favoritism <laughs> in, uh, in how those get presented. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioners. So we come to you tonight requesting um, funds for a remodel of one of our conference rooms. It's one of our smaller conference rooms that we've traditionally used for storage. Um, and we are in need of additional space for visitations for our foster children. Um, this room would provide us, because right now we have two visitation rooms, and a lot of times those two rooms are already booked. They have you know, families and our social workers are looking for other spaces to provide. Um, somewhere for that visitation and um, we would like to have the room itself a visitation make it a home-like setting as well as a bathroom a private bathroom for our foster children and a washer and dryer um, in that room as well I went through the cost and we give a rough estimate of what we think that would be um, somewhere around nineteen thousand five hundred dollars and of course with DSS a lot of that or all of that will be able to re be reimbursed at approximately fifty percent and Lori's going to kind of go through why exactly we need that room. So, as you gentlemen know, we um, do everything we can so that, so that um, our, as soon as children enter our custody, we try to find immediate placement. But that does not always happen. There's a lot of times that it's not appropriate placement and we cannot find placement for days. So children are often sleeping in our agency currently um, and we do not have the accommodations to do that. So um, children you know, need obviously a place that they can take a shower and we can wash their clothes and that kind of thing. There are often times that children come to us in situations that we need to have some immediate hygiene care before we um, reroute those children somewhere else. We do have currently two visitation rooms that stay full the majority of the time, and we're having to do those visits in conference rooms, which are not ideal for children. Um, and so we're asking for this so that our children, one, can take showers, and um, it would have, they can kind of have their own private space because we don't have that available in our agency. Any, Jerry, the, the social worker also has to remain in that same room with them the whole time that they're there. That is correct. Randy? You didn't say anything about uh, kitchen. Is there a way that, to be able to eat in, in this So room? we normally bring food in for all the foster children. So we do have um, a microwave, that kind of thing, in our lounge. They were good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so the next three are related to economic development, um, and the new economic development director, Brad Hufford, is here. Um, and Brad, if you want to come up, I mean, I know that you and I have spoken about these. Um, obviously, Brad's a little bit, he doesn't have the background on these yet. Um, and the discussion that Brad and I had, and he's standing there, he can shake his head, no, we didn't, or yes, we did. Um, 
was that, from my perspective, I wanted Brad to be able to evaluate these, spend a little time evaluating. Obviously, he's new in that position, and he needs to evaluate that entire department on what is best and what he feels like is best for that department. So I guess our, you know, and I said this to you the other night, what, what I was hoping to do was ask you for some grace as we go throughout this next year or the next few months as Brad has the opportunity to evaluate this and then maybe come back to you and say these are some things that I do believe are, are valuable and needed. Um, but if you have questions related, I mean, if, if you want to ask him about these, please do. So what you're saying is the three items that we have here is what Martin had put in the budget. They, they are what Martin put together, and uh, and with the, with us having a new economic development director, um, I'd like for him to have a, a little bit of time to study the department. I mean, he may come back and say that's absolutely not what I need to do. I actually need that money over here instead. Right. Um, but uh, you got any welcome. comments, Brad? <laughs> Yes, sir. You know, I appreciate the work that, that Martin had done putting these uh, before the, you all in the budget expansion. And uh, I d do agree with Brian, you know, um, just getting on board and uh, literally this is my end of my second week, still evaluating the departmental budget and determining, you know, where our needs are. And I uh, don't want to come in and upset the apple cart too much, but I uh, didn't want to commit to these without fully evaluating the, um, you know, the cost benefit of, of doing so. So I appreciate the opportunity to... Um, uh, answer any questions, but I, I think it would be best for me to kind of evaluate and then bring bring some uh, perhaps some, some more proposals uh, to you in the future. Any anyone got a comment or a question? I, so just in general, I mean, I, I guess what, what again I'm asking you to do is just give us a little bit of grace as we go through these next few months and give Brad the opportunity to come back instead of saying no, 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 we're not going to deal with that mid budget. At least give him the opportunity to to pitch that to you and say, yeah, I believe this is good or, or this is not good or, you know, this is what we really need to do. So if y'all will just, if y'all will take that, I would appreciate it. So you, can you kind of give us a timetable, Brad, or are you looking at maybe three months coming back to us or? I think that's a, a good time frame that will allow me to meet fully with staff and, and with Anita and really get, you know, dig into the budget. It's, uh, you know, been a, a lot of kind of you know, getting up to speed right now, but I really want to see where the money has been spent previously out of those line items and where uh, maybe there's some unique needs that we may have move, moving forward that we can uh, play around with those numbers. I think I think that sounds great. So great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. So the next one is emergency services, um, and I'm not sure who's handling that one. Carney's going to handle that one. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioners, thank you for allowing us to, to present to you again. Um, coming for a second year, asking you to consider an adjustment to 12 paramedic positions. Um, not asking for new positions or not asking a change of classification, but uh, a possibility of adjusting pay of 12 of our 32 paramedics uh, for taking a frontline supervisor role. And uh, let me just say that EMS itself is becoming highly competitive. Um, the marketplace for paramedics is, is um, becoming harder and harder to be able to bring paramedics in. We are now having agencies that are going up from anywhere from 21% to 29% in trying to bring paramedics in. We're not here asking for that type of increase by any means. We have very good morale in our department. Our people like working here. And um, they're very thankful, and I want to say that, very thankful for what you have done for them in the past in putting the pay plan in place. However, with our department, it is still a new department. And unlike other departments, when we have someone come in, once they're off probation and they're a paramedic, the only place for them to go from being a paramedic is one supervisor position and then administration. There's no other career plan. There's no other building blocks in that. And so similar to, to most of our other departments, we are just looking for what would be that career step, giving someone something to work for, but at the same time, something that's going to be very beneficial to our agency. As you know, we set up, we have three, three transporting paramedic units. On those units, we have two people over, over the course of four shifts. So what we would like to do is take one person off of each of those transporting EMS units, 
give them what we would call a senior paramedic. Again, it does not change their pay classification, but we just acknowledge them with some frontline supervision responsibilities, and we would, we would in turn give them a 5% increase for that. So the cost of that with benefits would be an addition of $33,000. Uh, to the EMS budget. And again, we're not just looking to make something, we're trying to make something uh, for our internal staff to have a career path and, and to help the agency all together. So we'd be glad to answer any questions about Quest that. Questions? John? We've got a similar problem with the Sheriff's Office, and we have not decided how to resolve that yet. Um, are you running two paramedics on every truck? Not all the time, but most of the time. So, in other words, what we have in if place. You had, if you had a paramedic and an EMT on a truck, then you would already have this structure. We would already have, that's right, the senior, <coughs> as far as the EMS call is considered, that is right. Okay. However, we do have in place that, I'm sorry, we do have in place, and, and we're very thankful for that, if a person, say, is an, an advanced EMT and gets their paramedic, we're immediately going to see them as a paramedic. We don't have positions of paramedic and positions of EMT. We only pay people for the certification they have, but we are able to make them a paramedic as quick as they are a state paramedic, okay. and that way help the county. Do you see an advantage of having two paramedics on a truck versus one paramedic and one EMT? Absolutely. You do? With the distance we cover and... and um, the number of resources we have across the county. There are times when those two individuals are going to be by themselves for a long time. And it's certainly good to have a second person at the highest skill available to be able to help. Does that happen on every call? No. But in the calls that counts, it really matters. Randy? Does most of your um, EMTs, uh, I mean personnel, live in Buffalo County? No, sir. Chris, would you say maybe 60%? So, and don't hold me to that, but I'm guessing about 60% are inside the county and the rest are traveling in. It's also true. We have people that are living in Beaufort County that are working in, I would say, Craven or that is other counties. as well, yes. Would the uh, increase in the COLA uh, in the 5% range plus, would that, I, that would help everybody that's on the truck? Um, COLA is good for everybody because that's just trying to, as you guys know, that's just trying to keep up with, with, with what's taking place across the board. I mean, that's, that's going to help. The, the thought of this senior position, again, is that you've identified someone who, who has a lot of experience in what they're doing. There's nowhere else for them to go to, but you want to add some responsibility to them. And we want to do that. We want to add some frontline supervisor responsibility and accountability to them. Um, and, and you're making a small increase for them in for doing that. Yes, Ed. You basically answered it. <clears throat> but you said you had 12. This this was covered 12 positions. Yes, sir. So the 12 positions that you have, they're already doing what you asked us to reimburse the $33,000 to reward them with. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, how do you, how do, if, if one of them leave, how do you get them somebody to replace them? Is there a is it class structure or is it, is it just because it's just a buddy system? No, sir. We, we would look at, if this were to be implemented, we would look at seniority along, along with certification and qualification of the individual. Okay. And moving forward and filling those positions, we would look the same way. So, so that's about like the classes that he has to Yes, sir. Okay. Other, other question? We'll Thank you very much, John. So the next one is the um, Sydney dive team. It's actually listed under emergency management. It was brought in that way. The, the chief of the dive team is here, and he's going to run both of these. One is an additional allocation, an annual increase, and then one is a one-time request for some training money. Thanks, Chief. Good evening, Commissioners. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I come tonight asking two things. One is our general budget, as you all know, is $10,000 a year. Last year, spent 10,672. This year projected will spend 10,865. I'm asking the increase of $2,500 because 65% of what we pay out in our general budget 
is insurance, workers' comp, and North Carolina fire and rescue insurance that we have. The rest of it is we spend on maintenance on the equipment, fuel, that type of stuff. So if you can find it, we would appreciate that increase. Because each year we keep going a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more in our little, if you want to call it savings, which is not a lot anymore as the years have gone by. So I would really appreciate if y'all would give some uh, serious consideration to that request. Any questions on that? Okay. You want to go to the training piece? Yeah, that's the next piece. This is a one-time request, and I want to say thank you, first of all, because last year y'all allocated the money for us to be able to purchase one of our super light helmets that we have. And as y'all know, with the plane crash that happened back in February, and the team was actively involved in that, the county commissioners from Carter County donated money to us for another helmet, which completed our, our unit. And we have both of those helmets now, so what we're asking for now is to bring the, the people up to train us. And the reason we're bringing them up is because the 10 divers on the team, everybody needs to have it. Trying to get 10 people down to Florida would not be practical for us. It's easier to get one up here. And that cost is $5,000. That's a one-time deal. And we would appreciate if you would consider that. Questions? You were not here when the check was presented. Was not. But we greatly appreciate the job that you did. Well, I, I thank you, but the seven individuals on the team that went, when y'all see those guys, you need to tell them. Okay. That was a tough task. If there's no question, thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Chairman, next item is from the Sheriff's Office. One's telecommunicator, one's additional patrol deputies. And Chief Deputy Rose uh, is here. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, I've got two requests with handouts for each of those. Is there one in particular that you would like to hear first? Oh, with the, I think the first one we have on here is the uh, communications. request that we have is for an additional two telecommunicators. Um, that would be just in some background. In 2016, uh, there was a, uh, that was the year that we went to full implementation of emergency medical dispatch. Um, in that year, we went from 13 FTEs and communications to 18. Um, and with, with the need uh, to have more personnel was just based on one call load and then two, the different types of information and the things that would go on in each call in reference to a medical issue. Where before, if somebody called in and they were having a heart attack and CPR was needed, we didn't even really have the authority to tell them or to instruct the people on the phone how or what to do. We could just say the help was on the way. Um, now, since then, you know, now there's different protocols that are in place where the telecommunicators are trying to diagnose through a specific protocol on every call and try to see what the, the most um, beneficial medical treatment could be done while they're waiting for EMS to arrive. You know, so that whole call goes from getting information to give to EMS while they are en route through... Um, to levels of calls from Alpha to Echo on how serious the call would be, letting the EMS providers know what they need to be gearing up for, um, and then two, also to give some reassurance and guidance to the
people that are on the phone that are with somebody who, whether they're strangers or loved ones, that they can actually get in the fight and get and engage in that. So um, that, that was the big need for that. Uh, two years after we had the implementation, we, we had openings within the communications office and we had some uh, cuts within other sides, uh, whether it was the sheriff or the jail, that we moved personnel around because we had vacant positions to take care of needs in other places. Um, since that time, we've had 16 FTEs in communications. Uh, we've been able to fill those spots. We've got one opening right now. Um, so we're at a good position to, if we could, get back to 18 FTEs, and that would have two supervisors that run the communications and 911 center, and then four uh, telecommunicators, all trained in EMD per shift, three telecommunicator level, and then one shift supervisor over, over top of that to assure that over a 24-hour period, 365 days a year, that we would have adequate staffing to take care of all of our needs with, uh, with that. Um, there was a question that came up in reference to um, calls. That was from two days ago, and I did uh, give you the numbers that are straight from our computer-aided dispatch. So that where, where I try to, try to make sure that you understand that that one call created. So if somebody calls in and says that we've got a motor vehicle collision at Fifth and Bridge. There may be 25 or 30 telephone calls that are associated with that incident. There may be a couple to three dozen entries into that call number for that incident, but I just wanted to give you the raw numbers of that, that what you're looking at is those are not just telephone calls into communications, but something that somebody entered something into our uh, computer-aided dispatch, and you can see from 2015 and 2016, which would have been the years that we implemented the program, the high number was 28,486. And then now with the 2020 number was 34,246. So it, it is a nonstop, time doesn't slow down. We can't forecast what's going to happen when. We have to be ready at all times so when the crap hits the fan that we've got enough people in the seats to take care of the needs that we have. So um, that's really all I have unless there's any questions from the board. Charlie, in, in addition to these numbers that you're sharing here, like the 31,000 calls, on top of that we have roughly another 10,000 that are related to EMS. Or so, yeah, the number that you see... That, in, that includes... Yeah, the number that you sh see should include EMS, fire, law enforcement. I mean, just throw something out. That, that's, um, if you take 6,000 hours in a year in round numbers, divided into that, that's a little more than five calls per hour with four people on a shift? Correct. Okay. Thank you. To fully understand uh, the call, it's not like it's a call that you get and you hang up. It's time consuming. There are some calls that can keep you there for an extended period of time. So if, if you have one telecommunicator here on this call and it's something that, that requires a lot of attention, then that means they're out of service. And so, therefore, it has to roll to the next. So you, you, can, you can look at it whichever way you want to. Uh, I understand exactly what you're saying because I'm the only one I can say that's been in this business and understands this business. So uh, I know exactly what you're saying. If, if I may add yes. to, to the point that the vice chairman was making, that we are specifically with those numbers and what you're talking about, talking about really the, the communications between the telecommunicator and things for the calls themselves. That's not talking about that, that these telecommunicators, they answer 911 calls, so they're dealing with the actual call. They're dealing with the dispatch of information to the resources, and that's law, fire, EMS. There are also the communications and the line for sheriff's deputies who are in the field that are, if they, get, if a, if they are checking out at a house for warrants, then every three minutes that deputy gets checked on. 
If they get out on a traffic stop, every three minutes that deputy gets checked on. If they call uh, 1033 traffic or signal 25 or one of the other five different ways that we can communicate that we're in trouble or just click the button and start yelling, those are the same people that deal with those calls. So it is, they also deal with NCIC hot files. If there's, a, if there's a missing person, then we've got an hour to get all the information in and they've got less than an hour to get the information in or out of NCIC. Um, if anybody, if any law enforcement agency around the country calls in and checks to see if somebody is wanted or have warrants on it, then they have to get that information out as well. So I thank you for bringing that up, that we're talking about a lot more than just answering a phone call and sending out an ambulance. These people are hot-footed. Um, domestic violence protective orders. Every, every DVPO that comes through the county, whether it's in a city or whether it's in the county, comes through the sheriff's office. And they've got a limited amount of time to get those orders in. And where that comes, where that comes and is very important on that is, is that that information that goes into the system along with when that, the time, the minute that that person that has the DVPO is served is used where the, wherever that person is. So if there's a violation of that DVPO, then that, that information could be the difference between that person being arrested, prosecuted, and convicted, or, or not. You know, so once again, thank you for bringing that up, and, and I'm, I'm glad that I was able to add, add a little bit to that. You you want to move into the Mr. Uh, Chairman. Real quick, while we're on this one, several meetings ago, um, the Sheriff's Office brought a request to the board to look at the assistant director's position. They have always functioned with an assistant director's position, and it came to the board, and the board said, "No, we don't want to. We don't want to make that an assistant director's position." Chief Deputy reached out and said, "As we go through the budget, is that something that can be considered again?" as we go through this. So I think there was a little bit of confusion when Chief Deputy Rose made that presentation to the board. There may have been a thought that we were adding a position or they were asking to add a position. They were not asking to add a position. They were simply asking to classify the person that's in the job doing that job with the right uh, job title. And it doesn't add anyone to the position. I think he's actually holding a position. Um, that he can't feel because of that. So um, I'd like to give Chief Deputy Rose just a minute or so, if with your permission, to explain that again. And if that's something that would help me as we get into finalizing the budget, whether that's something the board will consider at this time. Yes. Chair. Yes. On fiscal year 1617, we approved 18 communication offices. Is that correct? Correct. And you only use, and the max that you have ever had was 16, is that correct? As far as field positions, field correct. Positions. What happened to the other two positions, that we, the, the 18 that we approved? When there, was two, there was 16. What happened to the other two? Well, there was 18. Yes, sir. Got up to 18. And two years after that, we had openings in communications but then there was one year that we had five positions that were cut, and then the next year there was 13 positions that were cut. And in the transition of trying to make sure that the tasks were covered, we took everything that was a vacant position, reevaluated, and shifted that around. So those two positions became de deputy sheriff positions on patrol. So you didn't need them at that time? Well, we couldn't fill them at that time. Okay, and, you, and what did you do with the, the approved positions that... The, the, the 18 that we had. We took two of those positions and put those on patrol on the road and filled those at that particular point in time. We also, just to give a little bit more, there was, um, I can't remember the fiscal year, but there was, we went from 24 FTE or 20 FTEs to 24 FTEs in the jail. But then when COVID hit and our numbers started to diminish, we actually during that same cut of five, then 13, then we get five back. We move four of those positions uh, that was in the, the jail around two to add those or try to put those on the road as well. Thank you. You ready to go into the... Uh... So, we're, actually, Mr. Chairman, were there any questions regarding, I guess, the, if, if 
Chief Deputy Rose can answer any questions from the board about the assistant director's position in 911 at this time that way. Because Tuesday night I got to ask you about that, whether that's something you all are going to, uh, will, will let us move in the, as we present the budget and the pay and class plan. So. Well, did I understand it's not an additional position, but I guess there's an additional cost? Is that, that would be in the budget, Brian? No, you, you set the the amount of funds for that. I think the Chief Deputy is simply asking that they be allowed to classify that position as an assistant director position. The, 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 the person is currently at the salary level um, that's doing the job. Is that correct? Yes, and if you would, I actually put an org chart specifically for communications. And this is what we would like to look like on paper and in real life going into the next budget. Um, we, have, we have a person who is acting and doing the role as the assistant director of 911. On paper, that person is the technology specialist, um, not really doing IT, not doing anything else. But that got us as close as we could have to the pay rate of what the assistant director would be and it really goes back to and, and feel free anybody can can correct me if I'm wrong but when the pay study came out and when the template for the pay classification scale came out it was a, a one that was in pay scale 70 and one that was in pay scale 72 but both of those had different descriptions of the job but both of them were listed as 911 center manager so I, my opinion, and that looked as like it was a duplicate, and then the lesser of the grade was taken out. Now, if that was listed how it probably should have been, it would have been the 72 would have been the 911 manager, and the 70 would be the assistant manager, but it just wasn't like that. And then in the mechanism to correct that after the fact, you know, it, it went through a it went through a journey. But that now we're here here trying to fix it. We'll, I, I guess we'll do that uh, on Tuesday when we're doing the straw votes on each item. Is that? That, that would be fine. I just wanted the board to have the opportunity to ask the chief deputy if they had any questions about that because I think there was a little bit of confusion the last time he presented it because I was my, it was my thought or what I thought I heard the board say was they thought they were adding a position and they are not adding a position. They are simply changing the title to match what that person is doing so there would be no FDs added. Okay, we want to go to the expansion in the uh, Sheriff's per Patrol. Yes, sir. So this, this request um, I've gone back and forth on over the last couple of weeks on whether we even wanted to present it or not. I spoke with the Sheriff about it several times and uh, he, he pretty much left it up to me based off what I thought the feel from the board would be. And flat out in uh, light of recent events, including the events the, of hearing what the public has been saying over the last six months in reference to what, especially the Far East, you know, Aurora, um, Old, um, Blunts Creek, uh, Bellhaven, Pantega has been talking about as far as overall response of law enforcement and how and when that we can get there on time, then I thought that it was necessary to do. I also have one more uh, handout that goes along with really the same thing that we're talking about in this request. some talk over the last few months has gone around the level of experience at the sheriff's office. Um, some folks would say that we have more people that have zero to five years and some folks would say that we have more experience and that it goes to double digits and beyond. Where that goes, where the importance of that is, is that the more experience you have, the more life experience, the more age, the more law enforcement experience you have in any situation is going to most likely be better than if, you're, if you've got a bunch of green rookies running around. Now there is a time and a place and a need for green 
rookies in any law enforcement agency. You can ask those guys to do anything and everything they want to, and they'll say yes and do it. You know, where if you get guys that have 15, 20, or 25 years in, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to get those guys to do what you want to. So I just wanted the commissioners to have a look, and that's straight out of the personnel uh, records and manuals. That is, that is the experience that people have in law enforcement, whether with our agency or with another. And just looking up and down that spreadsheet, you will see that what I've been talking about for the last six months, a year, two years now, eight years, is, is accurate information as opposed to some of the other stuff that was going around. Where that comes into play here is, is that when I started at the Sheriff's Office in 2004, there was five FTEs on the road for each shift. Now out of the eight years or so that I worked on the road, there was far and few times in between that I actually had four other people with me working on the road. There would either be times where people were out on vacation, they were out sick, or we were short-staffed, which, which does happen and is still going to happen. But where we are now is that over the last two years, we've been able to shift around the office and, move, and maneuver through the FTEs that we have to go from five to six a shift. That actually puts where we can have, when we're full, deputies around the 850 square miles more effectively than we would if we had three, four, or even five on a shift. Now you can say, well, you guys are short-staffed and you're not full, so how would you know? Well, the reason that we can do that is that we can call out whoever we have whenever we want to. So we know what five, six, and seven per shift looks like at any given time and the amount of coverage and the whether, however you want to look at it, the reduction in response time or the increase in response time. However you want to, to justify the math and that, the more people we have, the more places we can be, the more places we can be, the safer the county is going to be. And Beaufort County is one of the safest counties in the state of North Carolina, no matter what mathematical metric you look at. You know, I never liked the Uniform Crime Report because it actually looks better than what we are, to be honest with you. But whether you look at the, the NIBRS reports, I think it actually looks a little bit better than, than what we are because that bases the amount of crime in specific columns towards a population of 100,000 or so. So if you have property crimes that are spiking up, then it can make you look really bad. But our level of violent crime makes us look really good because of the number of crimes in comparison to our population. So I understand the numbers, I understand how they look, but I also understand the, the calls and the pleas from the community when it talks about when we call 911, that is the most important issue that we've got at that time. And they don't care about any of the business that goes on except for if they call 911 and want a deputy to be there, they want a car and a deputy to show up quickly. Most of the calls that we deal with now, it involves multiple deputies and multiple cars just because of the nature of the work that we have. And calls are taking longer. We can't just, um, back when the vice chairman was on the road, they could probably end a domestic case in 10 minutes because they show up, they'd hit everybody in the head that was involved, and then they take them, they take the people that they needed to to jail, and the other the other half would go to the hospital. We can't do that anymore. Well, we just can't. You know, we can't. We we can't do it. So calls are taking longer. We're we're doing the best we can that with what we have. And then you know, I'll just end the sort of deal with. We have to be able to do more to help the school system with the issues that they have now and what their issues that they're going to have over the next handful of years into the future. They have, they have capable and adequate law enforcement on every campus. Half of them were with us at one time. So we're not, I'm not here saying that anything is going on or anything is right other than the fact that the boots on the ground with our office and the schools are working very well together, but they're going to need more help than what they have. If there is a situation, I say if, but it's more of when. When there is a situation that there has to be a full turnout of, of resources to a school for whether it's a mass casualty or whether it's a major fight or whether there's a major medical event, we've got to have people that are close to all of the schools so we can respond quickly, safely, and effectively help the situation and not have to wait. One of the things that you're going to hear out of the situation in Texas 
and it, it tears me up every single time, is that since Columbine, every law enforcement officer in America has been trained in rapid deployment, which means that if there is an active shooter, you get to the point that you can either eliminate the threat or you are eliminated through the situations that we're seeing there is a failure in that system of the law enforcement end. If there was a hesitation in any of the law enforcement to stop the threat, then that's a failure. And we, ha we are not prepared in Beaufort County for that threat. So I ask for you to consider this request along that line. Charlie, and I, I don't know if you can answer this or not, I failed to ask the superintendent when he was here on uh, Tuesday night, but I keep hearing at Northeast that we do not have a uh, security guard or a person with ally that's carrying a gun. Um, and I don't know if you can answer that or confirm it or not. I should have asked the superintendent when he was here. Um, the difference between what I've heard and what I've seen, you know, um, I, I'm probably not the one to ask about that specifically. Um, I do know that based off of the information that I know on Allied specifically, there is a different uniform level. So if you see an, an officer with Allied and they're wearing either the dark navy or black uniforms, then those are certified law enforcement officers that have carry and arrest powers on that campus. Uh, from my understanding, if you see somebody with Allied and they're wearing uh, maybe a royal blue polo shirt with khakis, then that is the level of security guard and they're, they're a step or two below the level that you would have certified with criminal justice training and standards, uh, powers of arrest on the campus and powers of, of you know, pretty much the you know, if, if, if you look like a duck and walk like a duck, you want them to be a duck. And they've got different uniform levels to differentiate what they can do and when they can do that. Brian, will you, will you send a request to uh, the superintendent and ask him to verify if, if that is true, uh, that sat in the community in some spots? And it's the only one that I that I've gotten any feedback from. So, so Brian, when, you, when you're when asking those questions, uh, I think we had a discussion as to having all the doors secured at all the schools. Did, did, did we not fund that? We did. We, we did that. Cause, the, cause one, and, and, I, and I asked that because when I, when I watched this last shooting, the shooter was actually able to come through and unsecured door. And so my, my thought process was, well, you cannot do that in Beaufort County, but if I am wrong, please, please let me know. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that is obviously the goal everywhere is to have hard security, have doors locked and things. But as you know, well, as you well know, humans are humans and somebody will may leave something open or somebody may prop something open real quickly to be able to do something. So that whether that's at a school or whether that's at a, a regular business, that's a challenge for everybody to make sure that everybody's informed and keeps the level of security where it needs to be. But we'll certainly ask that question as well. Brian, it, would it be out of, out of line to ask at our June meeting or do we need to go to July and ask the superintendent to bring, uh, to come in with the allied supervisor and kind of give us an update on maybe some of the questions we all have? I can certainly ask. It might be a quick turnaround for them. Okay. I, mean, I can certainly ask, but but I don't know, you know, because my guess would be it would be someone from their corporate group who manages that okay. and would come and speak. So they may be able to do that. I'll certainly ask. Well, um, we're right here at the close of the school, too, so it might enough. be better to do it in the month. latter part of the summer. Any questions? I mean, do you have another comment? I, I do, and actually I just want to, this is probably more for the benefit of the board and possibly the school board and then parents of uh, people who are watching this stuff go down on TV is that, 
you know, part of the rapid deployment training and the extension of that that we do through our office is, is that there is no obstacle at a school that is worth not destroying to get to where we need to go, um, up to and including driving a vehicle through a building to get doors open and glass broken and into wherever we need to go. And we actually go through training where, you know, if your mind is not prepared, you know, to do the things that you've got to do, then there's no way that you can do that. So we go through tabletops, we go through uh, training when we're doing defensive tactics and uh, firearms training. We do rapid deployment training, but we also do school-specific training to the point that our guys and girls know that there is no obstacle at a school that's going to stop us from getting to what we need to get to um, or for us to wait on any other resource to get there. If we have a school uh, shooting or something that goes on, every resource that we have available, whether they're working or not, are going to hear about it and show up. And up until the point that, that it is established that the threat is eliminated, which means that we kill them, they kill themselves, or they run away from the school, that that, that response is individual law enforcement response. We're not waiting on any groups. We're not waiting on three or four members of a team. It's just you go, you get there, you find out where the threat is, and you go, and you eliminate it, or you get eliminated yourself. So uh, we don't really talk about that a whole lot, but there's a lot of questions about it, and, and that is our stance as an agency and our community on, on how it is and how that will be. John, thank you, Charlie. I think that's something that this community needs to hear. Any other questions? I'll let him fill in the details. But I have I have access to reports from the early '90s, so yeah, I've read I've read a lot of them. Charlie, were you in here when Randy made his comments? Uh, yes, no, thank you. Uh, just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So the next item is from the tax collector, um, Mr. Wayne Kenyon, whose tax collector is here. This is a request to upgrade one of his customer service representative positions to a delinquent tax specialist, and he'll talk in detail about that. Good afternoon, commissioners. I appreciate your time. Um, when I was hired nine years ago, uh, Commissioner Belcher at the time asked me where did I want my office to go. I said I want to be in the top 25. At this date, we've increased our collections every year for nine years, except for the COVID year. I feel like taking a position in my office, making it more of a delinquent specialist to help with uh, foreclosures, to help with bank garnishments, wage garnishments, uh, debt set off, and other things like that would only increase that collection rate to get me to the magic number of 99%. That's where I want to get. This year, we're already at the collection rate we ended last year at. But I want to reach that level, and I think by reassigning a position in my office, it will get us closer to that level. So I'll take any questions you have. Questions of when? I just got one. Yes. When you said, I don't have a problem with the position that you're asking for, it, but, but what, how would this affect uh, the kids? You say you want foreclosures. If you look up, it's been a long time since we had any foreclosures from the kids. We've got a list of them every month. So would this person be somebody that worked close with him? Or no, it would be more of working with the young lady that does bankruptcy, but she'll be helping getting the information together for the foreclosure position so that we can expedite those and get those over. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, Wynn. Thank you. So your next items are from the tax assessor. Uh, Mr. Lloyd Salter is here. He's got three different ones he'd like to talk to you about. I'm going to inadvertently plug Wynn's position, actually. So the three that things I want to talk to you about today, briefly, as I try to be always, the first one is upgrading a CSR to a senior CSR. All I want, simply put, is one of my, my frontline base level starter position. I want to turn it into a certified personal property appraiser to be able to work on gap billings, gap billing, automobile billing, 
to be able to do that. Uh, North Carolina requires we do what we call gap billing, which we've discussed before, a couple different things. You hear about it in the news. There was a couple articles recently about Craven doing some, other places doing some. We need someone who is certified as an appraiser to be able to do that. So I'm going to take one of my, an existing position, one of my, my, my grade 60s up to a 62, certified to be able to get them into that. Doing that is going to create more bills. It does put more onus on the collector. You have more bills. You have to collect the bills. You have to do more on that. So that's why I say an inadvertent plug for, of course, wins position. Because in that, that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to create bills. We're looking to add more out there through this gap program. Simply put, I put originally a fairly low number. Me and Courtney were discussing this. We looked at the bills today just for the last four or five months. I believe we're talking about 15000 in gap billing once we start doing it in revenue. I mean, uh, you don't get all that. But, of course, you know, that's just four or five months' worth. So we would probably be more return in that than what I'm actually putting on here. I'm putting $3,500, $3,600 for something that would provide thirty to 40000 a year. Explain to me what gap billing is. Okay, so essentially what gap billing is, is simply put, and I'm only going to Courtney if I get it wrong, or she'll probably hit me if I do, but basically the, the best part to this is in automobiles, it simply put, you, you, you know, I'll even admit maybe it's happened in my family, but if there's a little bit of wait before you re-up your registration, essentially those months that you've waited, that you've, whatever, is a gap. That vehicle still exists. So simply put, somebody delays getting their registration. Most times, the DMV, the last what they're going to do is, the way that they're going to do it, that money, that, that time still exists. We get that information basically from them. We know that exists. State law says we're supposed to bill it. However, we've not been in a place to bill it. And in my predecessor's defense, probably didn't have the staff, the certification, the ability, everything else to do that. We want to move into that. That's, it's money. We're required to do it. So we want to do that, but I want someone certified to do it. I mean, state law says you're not supposed to put a value, you're not supposed to assess a value without being certified. So if I want to certify somebody, they're going to ask for money. So $3,500 is what I'm asking for for that. For your class. So you think your payback's like $30 for every dollar invested? Not quite. I'm saying that I think 30000 a year would be reasonable. I put in maybe 10 originally when I was looking, and we're asking for $3,500 as a jump. On that same thing, I'm asking to give you all money. <laughs> the next one we're talking about, seriously, the next one we're talking about is a business audit. I don't know how much you all you want to hear from me about that. I believe one of the commissioners, I'll look at you, Commissioner Bishop, I think he thought we were doing it still. Yeah. They just stopped a couple of years back. Business audits, compliance is a need to happen. You, you need a compliance program. Well, we have a basic compliance program, but bringing someone in, adding to that, doing that, that that's, that's auditing me. I want to be audited. The great thing about that is looking at all the counties around us, literally the counties around us, at minimum, you have a $3, give or take, you have uh, a, a return on investment of a dollar to three. So I'm saying 90000 uh, a year that could be more than that, could be less than that the first couple, could be more than that the first couple. It, it's purely looking back through our books and seeing what we've missed. It's auditing the records of businesses in Beaufort County. It's done almost everywhere. I'm told we're one of the few that, that isn't currently doing it. I, I think it's simple. Next one. A little bit more complicated. I have a new number on this, though. I told Mr. Alligood, and I'm sure he went, oh, man, really? But basically, I went to the vendor. I want aerial photography more often. We have this as a reoccurring number because it would be a reoccurring number to fly a new aerial photography to use in our upcoming reval, the 2025 reval. This is the time to do it. This would be to get new photography. The state one is not going to run in again for another couple years. So to get new photography, to be able to use that for obliques, what we're asking for is it has in here a little bit more than what I'm saying. It says 47. I actually got in writing. They're willing to actually drop this a bit. I worked with the company, talked to them, talked to them, said, guys, look, I need this bad. I need this bad. Waited for second quarter pricing, did whatever. They're actually willing, I've got here, they're willing to go down to $39,353.33. In other words, they'll reduce the number I originally stated to the board by roughly, I believe it's uh, in the realm of $9,000 a year 
in our contract to get that aerial photography. I worked with this same company when I was in Mecklenburg. They do flights across the state. They do all around counties and other places. I kept mentioning, have used them before, mentioned everything I could, said, come on guys, give me a break here so I can take it to the commissioners. So this is bottom line. This is what they'll be able to do. They'll be able to take a little off this. They'll be able to fly this. It's good quality aerial photography. And my last thing I wanted to say, what I also want to do with this program, photometry. I've showed Courtney, I've showed Wynn, I've showed the county manager, anyone else willing to look. There's an element of this I would love to put in the public on my website eventually. You can actually take this technology that, that you view these aerials. You can look, make it look very much like our GIS program. The great thing is I have it currently highlighted so we can take the sales we use in the revaluation and you can highlight it to show where every one of those is located in the county. So what that would be is that would be another way of being transparent. We'd be able to show this, put it on the website, and be able to have that where we're able to show the sales we have to use to do a revaluation, where they've been located, the data about them, the GIS data. We'd be able to use that as well. So that's a, a nice added piece to being able to get this new photography, this new imagery. Any questions? Can you help me understand the difference between what the state does and what you're talking about? Absolutely. So the most the most defining thing is I regret saying it this way. We're, we're, we're one of the biggest gap counties in how often we fly. Some counties do depend on the state to do the four years, but a lot of times you want it way more often. Medium-sized counties, small-sized counties, try for every two years or so. So what I'm really doing is I'm trying to supplement the state flight. The state flight's four years. I want one in the middle. The quality isn't much different. Most of this is what we call three-inch photography. There's a little bit of nine out in some of the farmlands, some out in the Tennessee area. Most of this in the in the areas are actually is a good flight, photography flight. This is up to almost GIS standard flights. You won't be able to tell much of a difference, but it's that I want it more often because, again, we're going into a reval and the state, state's not going to provide me a flight sooner if I want it. It's not going to happen. Well, if, they're doing, if the state's doing it every four years and we're at 2020 right now, then there's there, the new data is going to be 2024. That is correct. So you would probably get it at the end of the reval period. If I get this flame, we can use it while working the revaluation in this county. We'd be able to use it to see accurate data of what's been added recently, to be able to look at oblique imagery. We'll be able to quality control the property cards, the work done in the field, and everything else. Waiting on the state, we would get it when the reval's finished. So that would be great. We'd be able to look at it and go, oh, this is what we do. Right. Well, but I'd like to have it while we're working it. Oh, tell them the difference between orthos and obliques. Of course. So one of the other big differences is, and I use the word oblique quite often, but one of the other differences, simply put, and I'd show this, I think, at the workshop. So the GIS data that you tend to see on my GS site, a lot of times you're looking at a top-down map. You're looking at this, this just very top-down. The other advantage is this is all going to be oblique multi-image photography. What that means is you're going to be able to see all the angles of the house. That is so valuable in a revaluation because there are houses we don't get to. There's houses we're kept from getting to, waterfront, locations, different things in this county. It's great to be able to dial it right down and be able to look at a close-up image from different angles, the front porch, the back porch, everything else. It takes your accuracy up a lot. It's hard to put that in a number so I don't try, but I mean you're taking the accuracy of the revaluation up. That JS image, you're looking straight down. It's good, but you're looking straight down. So do you see this ongoing right now? To be honest, I'm probably going to come to you and try to keep every two years fresh images. So yes, forty thousand dollars a year from now on. No. Yes. What what we would okay. plan to do? Yeah. I mean, what we would plan to do, like I said earlier, is if you approve this, we would look to do it. He would get in a subscription program essentially with the vendor, and we would look to continue to do that every year, so that every two years alternating with state oblique, uh, state orthos, we would have fresh photography. So once it got in the budget, it would stay in the budget. And I'm not going to argue, I'm not going to argue with it, but it would be less than the amount that you were said, which is what I was getting ready to say. It's for a lesser value than that. Also, additionally, it's a three-year, I think, is what we did. So it's only for three, then we have an off-year, we do it again in the payment. But yes, it would be a four-year booking cycle. So we get new photography every two years. On, on the uh, business audits, uh, is everything going to be done in your office or 
they'll actually go to the location of the business? Now, the company that we want to work with is business service, of course, provided. They do a lot of work in Eastern North Carolina. What normally happens is, and actually at one point, Courtney worked for a company similar to this and actually did business audits. One reason I'm looking at her. But one reason and one thing that they do is they take a lot of the financial data. They work it in their own offices. They work it through them. That company would work it themselves. But they would occasionally make trips to see things for the machinery, things like that is needed. But mostly the way that's done is kind of up to that company in a way. But they would, of course, work with us as needed and, of course, would have a direct line with Courtney. Courtney would be supervising that program, again, having worked on it in Mecklenburg County and worked on it actually in the private sector at one point. Okay. Any other questions of uh, Lloyd? Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, Joe, for your time. So, Mr. Chairman, if, if we would now look at page 339, and I'll just briefly hit that, that is the water department. So you'll see that all of those proposed expansions I've already covered for you. Those are the COLAs, the dental, and the 401k. So there's no, you've already heard essentially the water piece. So Wes Overman is here for the solid waste. So if you'll turn to page 343, and if you take out the COLA, the dental, and the 401k, he's going to pick up at the enforcement officer and run through the one, two, three, four, five, six ones that he has. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, it is six. Some of them are related, so maybe it won't be but so bad. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about is uh, a part-time enforcement officer. As, as we've talked about the past several months, there there is have been some issues around the county of you know, legal dumping, problems at our collection sites, um, numerous things that I can't even, you know, say as many as we've had. People shooting cameras, <laughs> things like that. Um, we, were, we are looking at the possibility of um, employing a part-time solid waste enforcement officer. Um, you know, there's, there may be enough work for a full-time, but we figured let's start with small and work ourselves up to that. Um, so what we've done, uh, or just just for background, you know, we received notices of littering, illegal dumping, other violations. Um, Christina and myself are the only two employees in the county that work with solid waste, um, so our time is uh, <laughs> working too. Also, yeah, yeah. We, we appreciate all the help we can get, um, but uh, with our time spread between facilities, water, and solid waste, a lot of times. Um, we don't have the, the necessary time to devote to all the time going out and digging through bags of trash on the side of the road and see if we can uh, do something about that. Um, so with a part-time enforcement officer, uh, this person would be the front line of defense in combating the um, waste problems that we're experiencing around the county. Um, they'd be responsible for receiving complaints, processing them, investigating, and ultimately resolving the complaints submitted by subs citizens or what they have found themselves as they, as they are around the county. Um, they would be responsible for enforcing the uh, solid waste ordinance, which again we are currently working on updating. Um, and uh, they would also coordinate with other agencies throughout the county as the need uh, arises. Um, finally, they would also assist in making sure that the cleanup is performed appropriately by the responsible parties. So what I've done is I've gone through and looked at um, some job descriptions. Uh, let me back up. This has not gone before the MAPS group. So that would be something that if this is approved in the budget, we would still have to do that to get the, the proper you know, pay grades and job descriptions and everything there. Um, but I have looked at some comparable job descriptions uh, around the state um, and just came up with a generalized estimate of maybe about $17 an hour and for roughly $20 a week, and uh, with benefits and everything, we're looking about $19,000 to $20,000 per year for that person. Um, also included would be uniforms, fuel for their, uh, their vehicle, a laptop, um, and we would expect to uh, transfer a truck similar to what we've done in the past from the water department um, for use for this person temporarily until we get farther into the program. Uh, so overall estimated cost for one year would be about $25,500, dollars is what we've come up with. Again, that is a general estimate uh, that would have to go before the MAPS group for further, further evaluation. Um, any questions on that one? You're good? 
Okay. Uh, the second one uh, is related to another thing that comes up frequently. It is um, recycling services within the county. As you're aware, back in uh, July of 2020, uh, you all voted to discontinue commingled recycling services due to increased fees uh, at the, um, the facility that does the recycling. Um, since that time, I think everybody has a desire for that to come back, but you know that hadn't really made sense. So we're we're trying to come up with a solution here that'll that'll help us get back into that service. Um, we do have citizens throughout the county who have expressed a desire for that service to come back. I hear it. I hear it frequently, actually. Um, you know, why 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 don't we do this? Where can I go to take this? Uh, we'd really like to see it. Um, so what this proposal brings forward is reintroducing recycling services in a limited manner. Um, we would bring the service back to take aluminum cans and plastic bottles only. That would help us hopefully decrease the contamination um, by only accepting a certain couple of items. Um, and those are the items that we are required or are banned from disposal in a landfill. You know, we, we currently say we encourage you to recycle. We don't offer the service, but we encourage you to recycle. This would be offering the services that are banned from disposal in a landfill. Um, we would do this only at two sites, the landfill gate site and the Buck Jones site. And the reason we have chosen that is because these sites are not as heavily trafficked. It would give the site attendant more oversight over the operation, keeping more contamination out, which keeps our costs lower. Um, so what we've done is, um, I, this is actually when the budget was being assembled, the current rate at the recycling facility uh, was $100 per ton, which I believe was the same as when the price went up, if I'm not mistaken. I was not here at that time. So um, so we've, we've estimated 120 tons just out of what we could think we might would expect, $100 per ton. And then also our current cost with Republic was 10% charge on top of our disposal cost. Um, we've also included couple of concrete pads to make, you know, when people go to recycle, they don't have to trudge through the mud to go put these items in their, in the bin. Um, make it convenient and desirable to do the service so that we hope we get better results. Um, so ultimately what we've projected is $25,200 to, to implement this recycling service on a limited manner. Wes, what were the two sites? Landfill gate and Buck Jones. So we've got one on the north side, one on the south side, both somewhat centrally located. The landfill is Bath, right? Yes. Okay. Ed? I understand the little we having with, with recycling. And you also stated that you was going to put them in the less traveled areas to promote it. Why would you put it in the less traveled areas to promote it if you want, the, if you want people to start recycling? And I understand the cost factor here, but but if he was, I, I mean, I, I think it, we need it, but I think it would be better served if you put it where more people. Um, I'll, I'll take River Road, for example. It's our most heavily, heavily trafficked site. With one site attendant on that site, we do not, they do not have the ability to properly monitor the disposal of these items to keep other things out. When, when there's contamination in the loads, um, their facility in Greenville, ECBC, where this, this stuff goes for recycling, um, if there's too much in it, they won't take it, or you know, it could increase the costs. So if there's too much in it, it's going to end up in the landfill anyway. Um, so if we, uh, if we put these at sites where the attendant can better monitor what is happening, will be able to have a higher quality pro product to deliver to the recycling center and ultimately be more successful with what we're trying to do. It seems to me the problem with that test is if you're going to expand this, then you're going to go to the high traffic sites. So what are you going to do then? We want to start small and work big. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I believe um, you know, the, the mega sites that we're talking about, that would involve recycling, but we're a couple of years down the road. We want to get our feet planted firmly in a good process, and we feel like the best way for that to happen is to start at the less traffic site, 
you know, figure out what's working, what's not, and build from there. Yes. Uh, let me see if I understand this correctly. What you're looking to do is spend $25,000 to reintroduce recycling back to the public to get them generated in a, a mindset to recycle. Basically what's going to happen is the money that we're spending is to send our product to Greenville and they will dispose of it. We're not getting any uh, any money back by by sending it there because the money we would be spending to put it send it to the landfill would be less than the recycling fee that is that we're being charged. How much I don't know. It sounds like about 30, 40 percent less uh, uh, to to just send it on and put it in the landfill. Now that's not good, but basically, we're, this really isn't a business model that would be sustainable over a long period of time. That, that's definitely correct. You know, recycling is not a cheap business. Um, right. it, it's ultimately what we just feel is the most responsible thing to take. And we're, like I said, we're, we're collecting just these items because they are the items that are banned from disposal on the landfill. I agree with you. It is a responsible thing to do. And the public has to be re-educated right. as to how and why to go about this. I just wish there was a better business model to get started because sometimes when government gets started started on the off on the wrong foot, then it, when they do a little bit better, which still isn't good enough, uh, the, the the table has been set so that uh, uh, the the returns aren't never will be what they need to be. I, I, I'm, I'm debating whether we should wait for the mega sites and really do it right and try to handle product at the mega sites, even have our own personnel doing it and do it right and manage, try to manage it so that we are part of the market rather than outside of the market. Because this sounds like we're completely outside of the market. Well, let me, let me back up a little bit on the mega sites. Um, the, the mega site would still be the same model where we are just collecting and sending it to the recovery facility. Well, that, I mean, well we don't know that. These commissioners uh, haven't made all the decisions that need to be made for how the mega sites are going to be handled. I mean, that's what, like you said, it's way off down the line. I've got other ideas as well, and I think these commissioners need to have some other ideas. I mean, just just us just to collect and send to Greenville at $125 a ton, probably more later, plus paying 10% to Republic for, for transporting it. That just doesn't seem like a sustainable model, especially with uh, what we're going to be paying for mega sites. Now, I'm all for recycling. I'm probably the greatest advocate on this board. But I, I just want to see it done, get started off, off on the right foot. I'm not sure we, this is it. Yeah, we, we definitely do not, it doesn't go past us that this is an expensive proposal that, you know, we don't really gain a monetary benefit from. But, like, we're, try, we're trying to help these citizens do what is the responsible and the legal um, thing to do with their waste. Yeah, I, I, I get getting the folks back into uh, the flood, but I, I, you know, I don't want to hear from the folks. It's a bad deal. Right. I want them to to, to feel like this is a, the right way for us to go, and I'm, I just think there's going to be some other ideas coming down the pipe, and that pipe hopefully will be sooner rather than later. You want to go to phase two? Certainly. Um, these next two items are related. Um, it, these are um, things that have we have discussed last year, I believe. Um, uh, this this is the uh, improvements to our collection sites um, or collection site repairs. Um, as you may recall, uh, you approved phase one last year, which was immediate safety improvement needs at each site, all ten sites throughout the county. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Phase two would consist more of um, this. This would be, let me see here, paving and additional rock at the county-owned sites. So you've got Cherry Run, Chakawani, Landfill Gate, Ransomville, River Road, and I feel like I'm missing one, but who am I missing? It's county, county owned as well. County owned sites, yes sir. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is based on the proposal uh, that we brought out last year. We added a 5% increase. Um, that might have been a little low 
considering what we've seen even since the budget was put together. Um, but the, uh, the, what we've estimated for this phase two would be $186,003 for paving and additional stone. Any questions on phase two before I go into phase three? Does it include guardrails or? That was phase one. Okay. Yeah. So phase one was the sa immediate safety improvements for every site. For every site, I All got ten you. sites. I got you. you go to uh, phase three. Okay. Um, phase three is essentially the same. Uh, however, there is no paving. It's all stonework, and that would be at the, um, the least sites. Aurora, Buck Jones, Five Points, Pantego, and Yatesville. Um, again, based on pricing from the budget time last year, with a 5% increase added, uh, we're at 129466 You want to talk about the mega sites? Certainly. This is another um, expansion of what we've talked about before. We are currently in phase one of our um, mega master planning of mega sites with uh, Garrett and Moore, um, Mr. Vance Moore that came and spoke to you all. Um, him and his group are were currently working on some conceptual plans for us. And um, phase one consisted of conceptual site plans, site selection of two sites, and property acquisition assistance. Phase two would take us from um, would include property surveys, topographic surveys, um, wetlands delineation, geotechnical investigation, construction drawings, um, permits, and a project manual. And that would get us that much closer to um, constructing our mega sites. Um, as you may recall, um, a lot of the cost was in this was some subconsultant fees. Those were estimates. Um, so that could, you know, fluctuate some, but they did try to give us their best estimate as possible. Um, the total for phase two would be $275,500. Questions on phase two before I go to three? Is phase one done? Or you still phase one is in process. Okay. Uh, um, Phase three uh, would essentially take us through bidding and construction of the project. Um, and that, that includes bid administration, uh, contract execution, pre-construction meeting, contract administration, progress meetings, submittals, change orders, which we know we won't, we won't try not to do our best as possible, and pay applications and a final inspection and close out. Total for phase three would be uh, $202,488. Questions? I'm assuming as we look at this total here of um, $847,000 that we would have to use part of our reserve in solid waste or use ARP funds. now that we've got the clearance to do that. Yeah. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind there is obviously um, construction costs are not included in any of these estimates as well as any property acquisition costs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I, I think the number that Vance threw out there was, was it four million plus? To go to two mega sites? That seems seems I think that's what he's something along those lines. If we have a recession, those costs may go down tremendously. Not that we're gonna have a recession. Thanks for the economic report, okay? <laughs> I feel like I'm watching Fox News. Okay. I just kid. Um, any questions of uh, Wes as it relates to uh, solid waste expansion? Will we be able to get a report at the next board meeting on phase one? In June? In June you're talking about? Yeah. Um, we, can well, we can probably provide well, at least an update. least as close to when it's finished. 
Yes, yeah, so we can probably provide an update for the June meeting. Um, I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to get uh, Mr. Moore or any of his associates in for then. Um, we can definitely provide an update on what we're working on. Well, what I'm wondering about is should we be voting to continue before we've even completed phase one, and we and we agree that that's the good thing to do. That is certainly up to y'all's discretion. You mean agree to do the two mega sites? No, go to phase two, three, and four here. Okay. Before we've even seen what phase one was. Report. All right. Thank you. Wes? Thank you all. Brian? So we're starting now with outside agencies. Uh, the first outside agency is Aurora Fossil Museum. You currently fund them at $2,000 a year. They're asking for an additional capital outlay of $11,979 to upgrade their security system. And I think Ms. Crane is here. Is Ms. Crane here? Uh, Ms. Crane is not here tonight. Um, so you have that one in your book. It's a one-time expenditure. It looks like they're requesting $11,979 to upgrade the security system for the safety of their staff, community volunteers, and visitors. So you have all that information. Any questions? Any questions on the Aurora Museum? So your next one is BHM Regional Library. Um, you currently allocate to them in, in this fiscal year $2,200. $224,352. They are asking for uh, an increase of $4,488. Um, and uh, Ms. Carrie Blanchard is here uh, to answer any questions you may have regarding that. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, I am the new director of BHM Regional Library, and I would like to say that I actually began my career with BHM as an assistant. I got some education, went to a different county, and now I'm back to be the director, and it feels really good to be home for me. Um, uh, my husband and I do hope to be re relocating to this area, so we're just really happy to be here. Um, thank you. Um, so we are requesting uh, a increase in our funding, and if you're unfamiliar with how regional libraries work with funding. Basically, it's a partnership with the state funding. The more we get from our local funders, the more the state will give us. Um, and we had a decrease in our state funding last year that drastically hurt us. So we are asking from all of our different funders to just give some so then the state can give us some and it becomes a partnership. Pretty much, um, it's a match. So every dollar about you give our local funders will give us, then the state will give us, and then it becomes like a whole partnership for us. Um, I would like to tell some stories tonight. I won't take up too much of your time about what the library does for our community. Um, within the first week that I was back at BHM, um, there was a gentleman sitting outside our stoop on a cold February day. Um, we lit him in early. We were concerned for him. And he let us know that his lease had ended abruptly and that he had slept on the street last night. He was 76 years old. He didn't know where to go. So where did he go? He went to the library. Um, we were able to get him on a computer. He wasn't very technology savvy, but we got him. We sat with him. We found um, different agencies that he could link up with. And then he was able to be on his way in a much better situation than when he arrived. Um, we worked with social services to get him a place to stay. Um, our Bath Elementary um, works with our library. Um, they have a STEM sort of camp for the kids out there at the end of every school year. And what they do is they bring out the robotics that we have and the kids basically have a great end of the school year. They come out, they look at what we have in the library and they deal with literacy and the sciences. Um, 
in Bellhaven this past spring, we had tax services for seniors. We partnered with NC Legal Aid free of cost. Um, one of our librarians out there actually got service or certified to take the papers that you need when you prepare taxes. Um, so she was able to do that. And that was a great um, service to the community that isn't often offered for free. And then in Aurora, um, two times a week, our librarian there goes to read story times to the local elementary school. Um, it's great, love of literacy, and the kids have a really good time. When I was there visiting, um, pretty much she was dressed up as a leprechaun, so they learned to have a really good time. Um, so I would just like to say thank you so much for supporting BHM Regional Library. Um, we love being here. The four libraries in Beaufort County do incredible things for the community as well as um, the staff loves to help the community. I have worked at various libraries in the state of North Carolina and I can say my staff goes above and beyond for everyone. Um, they do more than some of the other counties that have libraries where there's even more staff. So I cannot say enough good things about them. Um, and I do encourage everybody to come and visit a local library, um, see what we can do for you, see if we're always up for um, suggestions of programs we can put on. Um, I'm always listening. Uh, my door is right near the front door of headquarters, which is just a couple, actually one block over. So um, I'm just happy to hear what we can do for you. And um, we hope we're starting some really good programming um, coming up now that I'm here at headquarters. So thank you so much. Are there any questions? Uh, questions from the commissioners? We're good. Thank Welcome. you so much. Welcome. Thank you. So your next outside agency is Eagles Wings. Uh, Miss Anne Marie Montague, uh, I believe, is here. There she is. And uh, you currently fund Eagles Wings at two thousand dollars a year, and they're asking for an additional three thousand um, to be a recurring. Yes. Good evening. The uh, difference in, in funding requests this year is because I'm asking for a different program. In the past, you have supported us. That $2,000 a year went toward our backpack program with the school children. Uh, this year I'm asking for $5,000 to be applied toward our satellite operation. About four and a half years ago, we, we realized we can have as much food as possible here in Washington. But if you can't get to Washington, to our location, it doesn't do you one darn bit of good. So we started a satellite operation and... Um, Nutrient agreed with us, and they were, they were our initial funders to get us going to be able to do this. So right now we have four satellites that we are working uh, within the county. Two of them are in Aurora. One is in Chocolinity. Uh The fourth one is um, with a Hispanic community, a little north of Washington on 17, through a Hispanic church there. And we're contemplating a fifth location by the end of the year. Each satellite runs between twelve dollars to $15,000 to run. So I'm not asking you to cover the entire cost, but I am asking you to contribute and support this effort. Uh, as I stated in my paperwork, we do not have public transportation. That that's doesn't do it. If you're in Aurora and you want to come to Washington, that's a $25 round trip. If you're living on $900 Social Security a month, you can do percentages as well as I can. Gentlemen, that's a lot of money for people to pay, and they don't have it. And um, so the satellite operation, by going into these pockets of poverty within the county, we are seeing people that we haven't seen before. We're able to reach people we haven't been able to reach before because <coughs> we're there. They don't have to come to us. You know, mountain doesn't come to Mohammed. Mohammed sometimes just has to go to the mountain. And that's what we are doing. So that is the reason for the increased request for this year. Any questions? And go over those satellite locations again. We have two in Aurora. One, uh, one works in the Mallard Creek, Fisher Village, Pamlico Court area. That, that will take, that is one complete uh, unit unto itself because we are limited in the amount of food that we can bring down. We only have the two vans and we, we work at very 
carefully, but there's a limit to what we can do. We can't serve 100 people at a time, or 100 families, rather. We can, you know, we're limited to about 30 families at a time. So that's one unit. The second unit in Aurora works out of New Growth Unlimited Ministries on P-Town Road. The third one is in Chakawinity, works out of the uh, First Baptist Church there on Highway 33. And then the one with the Hispanic ministry is uh, the Alpha and Omega Hispanic Baptist Church up on 17. The key to success in these programs is having these partnerships with these locations so that we work together and they work with us. A lot of times they provide the labor to assemble things or bring food out to the car, carry the food out to the cars to people or whatever. You know, so uh, we look for these partnerships because that, that makes it a lot more successful and we're finding that. Right now, almost half of our client base is entirely from our satellites as well as our medically homebound delivery program. So uh, it shows that there is the need there. I don't have to tell you, Biden bought a a bus to go out into the communities. Agape just has another medical bus that they send out into the communities because they're finding people can't get to their own, you know, those major facilities. Uh, you know, like I said, I can have a million pounds of food sitting here in Washington, but if you can't get to me, it doesn't help you one iota. So any that's all we do. Any other questions of Ann? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your past support, and we look forward to a good partnership. Thanks. The next outside agency is the Highway 1764 Association, and Mr. Mark Finlayson is not able to be here tonight. Um, as you recall, what they're, what they're looking for, we currently fund them, uh, the county currently funds them at $20,000 a year. They're, they are a membership group that is made up of counties and municipalities along the 17 corridor and now along the 64 or I-87 corridor. Um, the work of that committee, or the work of that group is to uh, eventually have US 17 four lane all the way from Virginia to South Carolina through North Carolina and then to ensure that uh, I-87 is, is done from Raleigh up into Virginia as quick as possible. Um, they're asking for an additional $5,000 um, and, and there's a, one of our commissioners that serves on that board and, and I actually serve on it as well. So I'd be glad to answer any questions the board may have. Any questions on 1764 Association? We're good, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next uh, group is the North Carolina Historium. Uh, Ms. Jackie Willard is here tonight. Um, you currently fund um, that group uh, at a current allocation of $15,000. They are asking for an additional one-time allocation for capital uh, in the amount of $15,000. And Ms. Jackie, would you like to answer any questions you have? Good evening. Good evening. Um, you've got our budget packet, and I've gone in way more detail than you want to hear again about the estuary and success and why we're asking for this one-time uh, increase in our appropriation. Um, it basically comes down to technology. We are um, on the verge of every system in the estuary either not working or having already crashed or getting ready to. Um, basically, since 2010, we've had some sporadic um, <clears throat> replacements when something, especially in the exhibit hall, broke or could, it was just so out of date or couldn't function or couldn't be replaced. Uh, but beyond the exhibit hall, all of the systems in the estuary and we are operating on Windows 2010, which keeps us from doing, uh, staying competitive. Uh, but the bigger picture is we have requests and calls that we can't answer. My email, for instance, comes in two days after um, it is sent. Uh, I can't send out a PDF file because my system will not allow it. Um, we don't have Chrome accessibility on some of our systems. Uh, the, big, the big picture is that it's, it's going to cost about $30,000 to replace all of our systems. And I'm not a technology person, and I know many of you on the board are. Um, but it seems we have been advised that it makes more sense to replace everything instead of keep piecemealing it. We've been operating for 24 years, so obviously we know how to operate a museum. Sir? Uh, but um, with record keeping, um, responding, 
uh, sending out uh, foundation grants, uh, just all the things I have listed here. The bottom line is we just do not have the cash set aside to replace our technology at one time. So we're asking for this one-time addition of $15,000 to help us to stay as a credible museum purveyor of uh, good scientific information uh, and also to remain a contributing factor to the Beaufort County um, economy. Uh, we are registering oh, close to 380,000 visitors now and this looks like this is going to be one of our banner years that people are now moving around again. So we do know that we make a significant impact to Beaufort County. We've become a destination actually. We have people now coming to the estuarium, coming to Beaufort County just to come to the estuarium. We had people from Raleigh two days ago drove an hour and a half here and an hour and a half back just to go river roving. So we do um, value your support and we feel like we are giving back to the community by helping the, keeping our waterways clean and uh, contributing um, to the lifestyle that we come to love in Beaufort County. Questions for Jackie? We're good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So the next group is the Open Door Community Center. Um, that is the Women and Children Homeless Shelter. Um, Ms. Norwood, um, the, um, this is a request for new funding uh, for $2,000. Um, you may recall uh, in 2019 when the facility opened, um, I believe the president of their board of directors uh, came and asked for $5,000 and y'all gave it. Um, I think he sits beside you right now, so <laughs> I'm not sure who's handling this one, but uh, it's a request for, for them to be only recurring funding at $2,000. <laughs> Hello there. I'm Doreen Trottier and I'm representing Open Door Community Center tonight. Um, as um, Brian has just stated, I believe the board ha normally funds um, annually to Open Door. I'm new to the area from Massachusetts, if you can tell by my accent. But I've been here about two years and been very much involved in Open Door Community Center. We are looking for additional funding and I'm not quite sure yeah, this would be a new funding source for them, 2000. We, we funded them at one time in 19 at $5,000. Okay. So, yeah. That was a one time. That was a one, one time. time. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rebels was the, was the chair of the board at the time and came and spoke and asked for those funds and when they opened the community center. The application shows that we gave them 2000 last year. Um, I, don't, I don't show that. Um, On page 283. That, that's requested in on page 109. Um, if you look on page 109, it's where we show outside agencies. We show them as, as requesting 2,000. Um, <coughs> yeah. I mean, it's their, their, this is the application they filled out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might have been a misnomer because I don't think we funded them last year. Okay. Well, it's all new to me. I'm new um, since last July. I joined the board. And uh, what we're seeing right now and what we're considering um, new expenses that we're seeing are really being driven by COVID um, over the last couple of years, more and more um, homeless, battered women and children needing shelter. And um, what there's just not enough um, shelters and beds. So we're full most times. Um, that causes us to put women or women and children in hotels. And with COVID, most recently, what we're seeing is because they've tested positive, they can't come into a shelter. So they, we put them into a hotel situation for their five days of, say, quarantine. And our rates have gone up. Uh, we do have negotiated rates with some of the uh, local properties, uh, hotel properties, um, and they were used to run between 50 to $60 a night. And now most recently, what we're experiencing um, is the hotels are not as empty as they used to be, and the rates have gone up to 70 to $75 a night. So just recently, one number that I do have is in the month of March, this is new expenses that we normally would not see, is about $696.50. So what we're requesting 
Um, as Brian is saying, 2,000, we had on our list 3,000, so I'm not really sure the confusing. We were looking for, um, for your consideration of $3,000 additional um, funding to be able to help us cover the additional cost of hotel nights due to COVID and shelters being full. Any questions? Yes, Jared. What does the city give you? City of Washington. What does the city give us? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I would have to take that as a question and get back to you, um, Mr. Langley. So, look, just to be clear, is it a, we had 2,000 based on the paperwork we were given, so it's a request for 3,000. Yes, okay. yes. I'm sorry. Any other questions? No other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the next group is uh, Ruth's House. Um, Ms. Valerie Kynes is Ms. Kynes here. She's not. Okay. Um, so they are requesting $2,500. Additional twenty five hundred, right? That's on two ninety one, page two ninety one. Yes, we we currently fund them at twenty five hundred, they're asking for an additional twenty five hundred. Any any questions that we need to shoot to them? Okay. We're good, Brian, on that one. And so the next uh, the next group is Chocolate Recreation Department on page 297. Um, they're asking for one-time funds for capital outlay in the amount of $134, $134,607. That you currently fund them at $7,200 annually, um, but they're asking for an additional capital outlay, one-time capital outlay. It says to install field lights, field maintenance. Um, a John Deere bunker and field rake, uh, metal storage building, canopy covers, and replacement of two pitching mats. That's amazing. Good afternoon. Um, first, I want to thank you for allowing this opportunity. Um, I have a few things um, to mention. Uh, for the second time, I'll just mention them. If you have any questions on either one of them, I'll be sure to elaborate on them. Uh, again, he listed the uh, ins installation of field lights, field maintenance, uh, new rake for the facility, uh, new storage building, canopy covers, um, and pitching mounds. Any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I can elaborate on anything if you have any questions. I'll be here for an hour if I start going into detail and breaking down every individual yeah, we, item. We, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, just, I'll leave questions on the floor. Um, what I will say is we have been operating on a budget of $7,200, which is allocated by the county, um, and that is to um, take care of all the uh, need, financial needs of the rec department. Um, I will mention that our light bill um, is currently uh, around five six hundred dollars a month. You did it over the course of twelve months, and you're already burnt the majority of that budget of our operations budget. Um, so, with that being said, we have been um, we haven't been able to make any upgrades. Um, we are a new we have new people in charge of the board now, and uh, there's if you, if you go to the rec department, you will see that there are many things in the rec department that are outdated. Um, that are not up to standard um, and it should be expressed that we not only cater to the Chocowinity, um district per se but we also cater to the majority of Beaufort County and some of the outside counties in some outside states so in order for us to be up to par to have a nice facility uh, we are requesting these monies. What, 
what does the tan of chocolate winter tea uh, give you? Um, that I am not sure. I believe um, we're solely operating off of the $7,200. Um, and, of course, registration monies, which is paid to the town, and they, of course, give it to the rec department. So each kid that register has to pay a fee. Um, but that is the only monies other than the $7,200 allocated by the county that we are receiving. In the, in the application, it says city and town's revenue is $5,000. So are and I you do, asking them for five? I do believe that that 5000 is the total number that is for registrations for participants um, registering uh, to the facility. So that's money that... The kids pay for registration goes into their account, and then they turn around and give you the five thousand back. So they're not really to, my, to the best of my understanding, correct? Uh, questions? Yeah. Yes. What's the population in the city of Chocolate? That's a good yes, question. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have that total. I do believe. Um, That's roughly you have to. I would say for the for the town of Chocolate, the actual city limits itself, uh, maybe twenty five hundred per se, maybe uh, that may be a stretch. <laughs> now, what is the what is the your, your, your participation for the kids that you have in your program from from the beginning to the end? I mean, you have baseball, you got basketball, all of them. Well, how many kids? Uh, total participation, uh, we're looking at uh, somewhere around one hundred and eighty kids. One hundred and eighty kids. Correct. Sure. Thank you. Does the town of Aurora have any any sports program at all? Uh, they do. Uh, we do uh, cater a lot of. Um, we do cater to a lot of their um, their youth. I believe they have a softball team, um, and, I, and I believe that's it. I think they're starting up some uh, youth basketball or something of that nature. Yeah. But for the most part, we um, their kids come to us for football uh, and baseball. What would the lighted fourth field allow you to do? Um, right now we're currently unable to um, play any uh, ball games at night. Um, so a lot of times our upper age kids, which will be our uh, 13U, I believe, and our 16U, those games are solely scheduled on uh, Saturday due to the fact that they can't play during school hours. And most games, five, seven innings, um, will exceed into the um, – nighttime hours so those games are being played on Saturdays which they start early in the morning and they normally last all day because of crunch time and you're trying to make sure that every game is you know held at the time restriction so adding lights on field four would allow us to have more nights during the week that we can schedule teams to come in and play um, in fact a lot of games if they are played during the week they're played at another facility because we do not have lights on field four and do you have any adult leagues? We do. Um, in fact, we have an um, adult softball league uh, that we play, um, and adding those lights would also allow us to uh, um, play some games on that field as well at night times. Okay. And, and of the, all these things in here, what is the priority? Uh, priority for us uh, would be lights on field, uh, on field four. That is priority. Other other questions? Just for your information, the total allocation that we've been spending is fifty-five thousand in the in the entire county. Yeah. For rec departments, correct? Right? Yeah. Okay. For all all seven municipalities. Okay. Thank you, sir. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But but in the past we have done some one time stuff. Sure. For I trying to remember, ten thousand dollars might have been the biggest one time. No other questions. Thank you for thank time. you very much for your time. So the town of Bath Recreation Department is the next request. Uh, you currently fund them at six thousand dollars a year. They're asking for a. $2,000 one-time capital outlay uh, and says for wiring, record box updates, swell, uh, drainage issues, and new equipment for players and electric work on school boards. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody from the town is here. There's 
There's no one here, is there? Okay. You want to go to the next item? Yes, sir. The, the Humane Society of Beaver County is requesting um, uh, the board start a um, um, program for spaying and neutering feral cats and vaccinations for them at $10,000. Dr. Poffelberg and uh, Ms. Peterson are here to answer any questions you may have about that. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, just a little background information. Beaufort County has an abundance of homeless feral cats reproducing at an alarming rate. In December of 2020, the Humane Society started a spay-neuter program initially funded with $30,000, which Dr. Chuck Manning had left to the Humane Society for the benefit of the animals. It was decided to offer vouchers for $20, which would pay for either spaying or neutering a cat and include a rabies and distemper vaccination. Pamlico and Tarrer Animal Hospitals both agreed to reduce prices for the Humane Society. In just 17 months since we started this program, we have actually neutered 1,325 cats in 17 months, with another 155 having appointments for the procedure. This has cost the Humane Society $93,909.45. And although we have raised the price of the vouchers to $25, we are running out of money. Every penny over the price of a voucher has been generated by us through donations and fundraisers, the main one being our annual auction party, which is held at the Civic Center in October. Obviously, with so many cats no longer reproducing, this program is a benefit to the county. And as far as the county cost is, for the year 2021, to have an animal at the shelter cost $265.03. And the number of cats in the shelter in 21 was 978. Now, Dr. Poffenberger has a little more information for the medical part. So the only true solution to the overpopulation problem is an effective and concerted effort to stay and neuter. Um, the cat voucher program that we have started has already proved to be an effective program. Not only are we reducing the number of kittens being born, but we're improving the overall health of the animals, you know, that are in the area, including rabies vaccines, which um, are included in the voucher. The rabies vaccine is, is important because cats and dogs are kind of a barrier between the human population and uh, wildlife. So um, finally, the way in which we treat our animals is a reflection of compassion within our society. And, you know, I see this daily with people moving to the area, and they really are concerned about the condition of our shelter, the way animals are cared for in this county. And so um, supporting a program like this, you know, would um, really reflect well on the county and those that are moving to the area. Um, obviously something that's supported by our local shelter because our chief animal control officer sat through this entire meeting just to show her support. Um, and we know this is a new program, but it is a pro proven program that, that's working. I mean, I can tell you it's working because to get all those 1,500 animals done, I've given up some Saturdays to do the surgeries, um, but that's how committed we are to it. And we feel like it will really, you know, pay back the community in, in the county in, in dividends. Um, any questions? Questions? Uh, one question. How close are rabies the closest outbreak in Beaufort County? Yeah, um, have you had any tests positive? Yes, uh, positive fox uh, from the Lux Creek area. Uh, bats come back, uh, raccoon. 
Yeah, it's not a it's not something that you're going to see lots and lots of cases, but when you see the one, it is deadly. And there have been incidents where people were exposed through feeding ferals, so it's just kind of another benefit to, to looking after them. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that wraps up your service expansion proposals for a general fund, um, water fund, and solid waste. So before you break, I got one thing for you, if y'all have some Okay. Questions. Are you ready for that? So I got a, I just got a text message, or a few minutes ago I got a text message from Kelly Hopkins, the elections director, and she said to let you all know that they are um, recounting the commissioner race ballots on Tuesday at 3 o'clock if you would like to see the operation of the new high-speed scanner. Tuesday at 3? Yes, sir. Do you do you have anything else? Oh 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 yes, I'm sorry. I was <laughs> I thought you were talking about the election, so I was like, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Yes, we will we'll put together a spreadsheet for you and we'll have it set up like we've done before where we can keep a running total and adds and subtracts and let you know exactly where you are. Um, there are there's one additional thing that I want to throw to you just so you have it so when you walk in to Tuesday night, um, the Cooperative Extension Director had asked Previously, and we told them we would look at it, uh, I think one of the, several of the board members told them they would look at it at budget time. You recall the longevity policy that was put in and adopted by the board did not include um, agencies that were shared agencies. So the Co-op Extension is a shared agency with the state of North Carolina, and it did not include longevity because our, our the way the policy was written was that it, the, the home agency would be responsible for that. Um, and his, his response on that after we passed it was that NC State does not do that. They do that for some of their employees, but they do not do it for all of their employees. So they, what he would like for the board to consider is if that could be something that they could be eligible for if NC State does not cover them under that as well. So we'll have that for you on Tuesday as well. Okay, so on Tuesday night we meet at 5 o'clock. Tuesday night is 5 o'clock, and essentially we're here to answer questions, run numbers for you, and our hope is that um, on Tuesday you're able to walk out of here with a, generally a close budget to where you want to be, um, because then we would have, that would allow us to prepare uh, the information for the, for the public hearing that would occur, it's already scheduled, uh, at your regular June meeting, um, and then the board has the option of adopting that night or we actually had already put on the schedule a special call meeting later in the week on Thursday um, if you wanted to hold and deal with it then. So, but that's, that's how your schedule lays out. Any, any additional comments? If not, we will recess until uh, May the 31st, Tuesday at 5 o'clock. <laughs>